Thank you. Um, of course, thanks to Vendelin and uh, Lattice and uh, the organizers. Um, it's great to be here. So this week, I'm mostly going to be talking about conformal weldings of random surfaces. Uh, So there's a particular model for a random surface called Liouville quantum gravity that is in some sense the canonical model for a random two-dimensional manifold. And what we're going to aim to show is if you take two of these random surfaces and you glue them together, stitch them together along their boundary, and then you or along part of their boundary, that gives you a new, new surface, then you can formally map that new surface into a planar domain, then this boundary between them should be mapped to an SLE curve. So in some sense, SLE is what you get when you glue two random surfaces together. Um, and and there's a lot more to it than that. When we actually start constructing this thing explicitly, we'll find that uh, the way we set it up, there are a whole lot of symmetries that would seem completely out of the blue unless you had a belief that these uh, random surfaces were scaling limits of some sort of discrete surfaces you could understand. And, um, and we'll actually show that these uh, these things we aim to prove are, are really consistent with, um, with the belief that this continuum random surface called Louisville quantum gravity is a scaling limit of discrete random surfaces. And the continuum random surface with the random SLE curve on top of it should be a scaling limit of somehow discrete random surfaces with a special path on them. OK, so this is, this is a fair amount to accomplish in, uh, in five lectures. But I'm hoping we can, uh, I can actually do this. So um, these, no these notes here, uh, these seven pages, I, I have them uh, online. And hopefully, I'll have a, I'm still editing them. But you can, you can access them online already. Um, and. Uh, and I'll show you where. I actually gave a, a three-week course um, uh, at the Pacific Institute of Mathematical Sciences uh, summer school, just ending a week ago, which had some overlap with this material. And, um, and when you go there, you can get lecture notes not only for my course, but also for Greg Lawler's three-week course, or one-week course there. And, uh, and I have you know, all kinds of slides, uh, various papers. This is a, a paper with Bertrand Duplantier, new version. This is where uh, um, I have a, a recent paper with, uh, uh, with Oded Schramm that's not yet on the archive on the, the contour lines of the Gaussian free field. And um, all kinds of slides. We had three pr problem sets. Um, some various people wrote solutions to these problem sets. And, um, and here at the bottom, conformal weldings of random surfaces, SLE in the quantum zipper, rough draft. This is the draft I showed you there. And so it's 47 pages, and it contains uh, essentially all the material that we're going to be covering in this course. So if you have time to read through that, or at least start reading through it tonight, that will be very helpful in understanding what's going on. OK, so I'm going to start out this course by, well, the way I start out all my lectures on this subject, which is by showing you some of my favorite pretty pictures. And, uh, and this will serve as motivation. Most of this week is going to be Blackboard and, um, and actually really getting into the details of this uh, into the details of this conformal welding question. OK. 
So now you can relax and I'll show you some pictures that at least some of you have seen me give before, but here we go. So, um, no question, how do you construct a random two-dimensional manifold? Well, first of all, there's a discrete approach to doing it, which would be, I give you a bunch of unit squares. They're length one by one. And I give you a lot of these. Maybe I give you n such squares. And I ask you to stitch together these squares to form a surface. So you've got n squares to work with. And you're going to start gluing them together stitching them together in some way. OK, do I have the right number? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. I can use one more. OK, so here, I've constructed a surface by taking unit squares and gluing them together along their edges. OK, I could think of this as these are manifolds with boundary or they're metric spaces. Either way, I'm just identifying them along their edges, unit length to unit length, uh, to get a bigger surface. And here, the surface, you see I haven't made a nice grid pattern. Some places I have five of these things meeting at a point. Some places only three. And, um, and here, the embedding in the plane doesn't reflect the, the sort of natural metric or, or, or structure of this manifold. Because even when I've glued them together, I'm still thinking each of each of these as a unit square. OK, so this, this inherits a a metric structure from just these individual unit squares here. And this is a random surface. Right? Whatever you, else you want to say about it, that it is. Um, and why is it random? Well, because I could, I, I could form it by, say, looking at all the ways of uh, just combinatorially, how many ways are there to construct a surface like this out of 10 squares? There's some finite number of ways of doing that. And I could say, choose uniformly among all the ways of doing that. And that would give me some random surface. And then there are variants of this. I can, you know, I can insist this thing is on the sphere. And uh, you know, I can weight the boundary in various ways. But um, OK, but that's the model. That's, so there are all kinds of variants of this random surface. Uh, these are sometimes called random planar maps. They're versions where you have a, a random surface with a, with a special curve on the surface, or multiple special curves, or special points on the surface, or at least a distinguished edge on the surface. And, um, but in any case, the natural question is, what, what would happen if instead of taking 10 squares, I took a billion squares or a trillion squares and generated what in these random surfaces? Is there some sense in which these discrete random surfaces are converging to a continuum object, sort of a limiting random surface? Well, we don't yet have a fully satisfactory proof that these discrete models, which are sometimes called random quadrangulations when they're quadrilaterals, triangulations if we use triangles here, random planar maps, sometimes called random matrix models because uh, you can count these things using certain integrals involving random matrices. Um, so what's the continuum analog of this discrete guy? Well, we have an answer. And that's this Louisville quantum gravity. 
invented by Polyakov in the late 70s. And uh, so it turns out that we have some pretty compelling reasons to think that this is the scaling limit of this, this continuum uh, object. Um, and how did it start? It, this, the physicist community uh, first became convinced that these approaches were equivalent uh, when they discovered something called the KPZ formula in the 80s, which showed that certain dimension computations on the discrete side agreed with certain scaling dimensions on the continuum side. And, you know, when you see a lot of numbers matching up, you produce a list of numbers in the discrete world, a list of numbers in the continuum world, you start to think, well, this can't be a coincidence. Okay, it's very far from a proof, but, or even a conjecture, because, you know, it wasn't formulated exactly what it means for discrete things to converge to continuum once. Or, but, um, but at least it's, it's been believed by everyone in physics. Uh, I believe, is, is that right? Did anyone not believe it? Which one? People, people knew it, he says. Oh, people who knew about it, yes. Everyone who knew about it believed it. Um, okay. Right. Uh, since, since the 80s, at least. Um, and uh, so this is the big open problem for everyone here to think about trying to, to prove this week is, you know, why do these discrete guys converge to the, the continuum one? Okay, well... One thing that, when we talk about convergence, we say, oh, it's important to keep in mind is the Riemann uniformization theorem, which states that every smooth, simply connected Riemannian manifold, M, if I give you some surface, some funny surface, M, or maybe I take this surface to be my M, but in any case, M can be conformally mapped. If it's a, something with boundary, you can conformally map it to a disk or to the whole plane or the complex sphere, the whole plane plus infinity. But these are the, um, these are the only three cases. If I give you any simply connected Riemann manifold, you can map it to one of these objects conformally. And that's called the Riemann uniformization theorem. The Riemann mapping theorem is the special case where M is a subset of the plane. So you know any open set in the plane can be conformally mapped to any other open set of the plane. But it, this holds not only for subsets of the plane, but for other uh, two-dimensional surfaces as well. Um, And another way of saying that is that you can parametrize M by points in one of these spaces in such a way that the metric takes the form some function times dx squared plus dy squared for some real valued function lambda. And in this case, uh, so since lambda is real, e to the lambda is just a positive function. So some positive function times dx squared plus dy squared. And in this case, the x and y are called isothermal coordinates or isothermal parameters for M. So, you know, generally speaking, if I have a manifold, and what's the definition of a manifold? Well, I have, you know, some abstract surface M, but how do I describe the surface M? Well, I, you know, I break it up into pieces where I can give you a coordinate chart. And when I pull the metric down to the coordinate chart, the metric on the coordinate chart will have some form some a times dx squared, or maybe axy dx squared plus a function b of x and y dy squared plus a function c of x and y dx dy. This would be the general case of how you write a metric uh, in Euclidean coordinates. And... Um, but the fact that this map is required to be conformal sort of imposes that A and B are equal to each other and C is zero. 
because you know, if I take a little circle up here, it has to map to a little circle approximately down here, not an ellipse. So that force is going to be the same. So, so essentially, this is just saying that any uh, function can be written in this way. And, um, and that means if we really want to choose a random manifold, it's enough to kind of choose a random function, lambda. Because if, if we put the manifold in the right coordinates, then uh, you know, the set of all manifolds is sort of canonically isomorphic up to these Mobius transformations to the set of all simply functions. OK, so again, I, I hope people like pictures that some of you have seen. But here are um, some of my favorite pictures uh, of Riemann uniformization from uh, David Gu's web page. So this is uh, someone who worked with STL at Harvard uh, on the problem of really visualizing these conformal maps in the Riemann uniformization theorem. And uh, they took various classical works of art, famous sculptures, and conformally mapped them to spheres and planes and punctured disks and such things. And, uh, and here what you have is this is a, a, a three-dimensional a surface. So the boundary of this sculpture is a a two-dimensional surface which is embedded in three dimensions. So this inherits some geometry from three-dimensional space. What I'm do doing is I'm taking this surface and conformally mapping it to a sphere. And here you're just seeing it from one side. But you can see down here, they, and we've We've taken the shading up here, and we've, we've mapped it to decide how to color it down here, just so you can see what up here gets mapped to what down here. So now you can see what's going on. We have a um, surfaces with all sorts of bumps in them, and twists, and, and turns, and, we, and you map it out, and it becomes something perfectly spherical. And you see, any place here, if I draw a little right angle here, it will look like a right angle down here. So another way to think of this is that locally, this map doesn't distort shapes or doesn't change angles. Even though on a, on, a, on a global scale, things are distorted. And so if I have an eye, it's about the same shape down here. It's not really long and skinny. But its size may be different down here from what it is up here. OK. So any questions about what these pictures mean? I mean, if uh, you know, they're, they're just pictures, but I at least want this idea to be clear because you know, all through these lectures, we're going to be talking about Riemann uniformization. So um, here are other examples of these pictures. Here, if you take a genus one surface, uh, say a, which is a torus, then you can't conformally map that to a a sphere. On the other hand, if you take the universal cover of this, you can conformally map that to the plane. So you take this little kitten, whatever it is, you, um, you take its universal cover, and that's now simply connected by definition, and you can conformally map that to the plane. And then each of these, and what you get is uh, infinitely many copies of this creature tiling the plane. Okay, don't you like these pictures? <laughs> I, I'm a huge fan of, of his pictures. I, I show them everywhere. I actually finally met him a couple months ago. He thanked me for, for advertising his, his pictures. But I, I really think these are nice. Yes? In, in this case? Um, <clears throat> No. I mean, probably not exactly what you're looking for. Uh, 
So you, what you'd like to do is just, just have a place where you could see this picture and alongside it see the, the density or see this lambda. Uh, I guess I don't have exactly that for one of these guys, but you can sort of see what lambda is here. I mean, lambda is telling you how much, essentially, if I look down here, lambda is telling me the derivative of the map. E to the lambda is the derivative of the map when I map from here back up to here. So it tells me down here how much area upstairs is represented by a little circle downstairs. And um, so every point on this space, there's some distortion, some amount by which things are stretched. And that gives me a function on the sphere. And lambda, is lambda is defined everywhere on the sphere. And, and basically where, you know, here, there's a little ear that's mapped to a big space. So probably you would say lambda is kind of uh, small here. And in a place where if you have a, um, you know, something that's big up here that is mapped to a small space down here, maybe the tip of the nose, you would say lambda was uh, large there. So lambda, basically there's an area measure up here and when I pull it back, I get an area measure here. And um, lambda is just the log of the, the density of the area measure down here. So looking at these pictures, you should be able to visually reconstruct in your mind roughly what lambda is by sort of what the relative sizes are up here to sizes down here. Um, you can do the same thing in higher genus. If I have a higher genus surface and I take its universal cover, then I get something which is, uh, which is homeomorphic to the sphere. And if I can formally map it to a sphere, then the copies of this in the lifting become a tiling of hyperbolic space. And, well, you can go on. They, you know, if you, if you take holes out of these guys, then you can map it to spheres minus disks in canonical ways. And okay, you get the idea. Um, but an important thing about this is the way I like to think of it is, if you take some coordinates down here, if I put a, a grid down on one of these spaces and I lift it back to this space, that gives me a, a coordinate chart upstairs. And uh, so he has another set of pictures. This, I guess, is Michelangelo's David, um, where he's basically taken uh, coordinates uh, on these pictures. And I guess he, he broke it into a few pieces so that it would look nicer. Um, can anyone think why he, why he did this? Why, instead of doing a global conformal map, he, he did the two arms separately? Well, okay, it's not a well-defined question, but, but my, my uh, thing is that if you really did a conformal map from this to a sphere, then what you would find is that the entire arm and the entire head and this entire arm here would get mapped, each get mapped to a very small space you have some intuition about conformal maps. Um, and essentially, you know, it's, it's a Brownian motion. If you start a Brownian motion on the stomach and let it go, it's not going to spend very much time up here. I mean, it's, it's, it's unlikely to end up at the tip of the arm before it hits another place on the chest. because It would take a long ways to get up there. So in some sense, the tip of the arm is very small. So the hand is very small compared to, you know, if, if I map it, if I pick three points on the body to map to three fixed points on the sphere, then the arms and the head will get mapped to very small regions. Okay, so, so in order to get about the same sizes, he does some other things because he was, he was concerned about how this looked. He wanted it to be pretty and look like checkers everywhere. But, okay, but again, the idea is just keep in mind you can Whenever I talk about a random surface, M, 
I'm always going to be thinking of there's some coordinate space for it, and so I have some isothermal coordinates on it. OK, so that's enough of those pretty pictures. Uh, let's move on to some other pretty pictures. OK. So, um, Polyakov in 1981, in one of his first papers on this uh, subject of what we now call Louisville quantum gravity, um, <clears throat> gave his motivation for the subject uh, as follows. He said there are methods and formula in science which serve as master keys to many apparently different problems. The resources of such things have to be refilled from time to time. In my opinion, at the present time, we have to develop an art of handling sums over random surfaces. These sums replace the old-fashioned and extremely useful sums over random paths. The replacement is necessary because today gauge invariance plays the central role in physics. Elementary excitations in gauge theories are formed by the flux lines closed in the absence of charges, and the time development of these lines forms the world's surfaces. All transition amplitudes are given by the sums over all possible surfaces with fixed boundary. So, so Polyakov was interested in string theory, or this is sort of a precursor to string theory uh, as we know it today. Um, but he was interested in the time evolution of a string. So if you have a string, that's a one-dimensional object. But if you try to graph what the string does in time, then the, that's a two-dimensional object embedded in, in space-time. So your space-time, whatever it is, I don't know, 11-dimensional, 4-dimensional, depends where you live. Um, so this space-time is uh, it's some object, and you have some surface in that object. And his idea is that you know, if you wanted to do a, a Feynman path integral, so in quantum physics, a particle doesn't just take one trajectory. In some sense, it takes all possible trajectories. And you have to integrate over all of them. Um, so uh, the idea is, well, if you really wanted to do quantum physics with uh, strings, then you should have to integrate over all possible trajectories the string could take. And so in some sense, you're integrating over random surfaces. And, um, and, and even if you don't care about string theory, his point was that if you care about these gauge theories, they have things called flux lines in them, and you might still want to integrate over the trajectories of these flux lines. OK, so. And, you know, most, you know, string theory has gone in many different directions today, but at the heart of, of it really is this conformal field theory and the idea of, you know, you, you have a, a quantum random string. Whenever you have a, this quantum object, there's no getting around that it doesn't take just one trajectory. You have to integrate over a space of them, and then you need a measure. OK. Um, so what's the natural measure to take? Well, what Polyakov does is essentially, the way we understand it now, is to take this lambda and have it be something called a Gaussian free field a constant multiple of a Gaussian free field, which, which Wendelin discussed last time. So, so just set notation. So the Gaussian free field, as I will think of it, first there's the discrete version. So I'll call the standard Gaussian on n-dimensional Hilbert space. Whenever I use standard Gaussian on a Hilbert space, I just mean the Hilbert space whose density function is e to the minus the length squared of the vector over 2 times the appropriate constant. And whenever you have a standard Gaussian, you can write a sample from this distribution as, as the sum, i goes to 1 to n, of alpha i times v sub i, where the alpha sub i are uh, i i d, so independent, identically distributed, mean zero unit variance, normal, random variables. And the v i are an orthonormal basis for your space. 
Okay, so standard Gaussian just means if you put it in orthonormal coordinates, each coordinate is an independent one-dimensional standard Gaussian. And uh, the discrete Gaussian free field <coughs> is a case of this. So in this case, I will let f and g be real-valued functions on the vertices of a planar graph. Let me draw you a planar graph. I guess I've got one over there, but we use this one. So this is a planar graph. Or maybe it could be a grid. No need to take such a strange one. But a Gaussian field will be a map from this grid to the real numbers. And, um, and if I give you two functions, f and g, from the vertices of the graph to the real numbers, then there's a natural inner product between the two, which I'll call the Dirichlet inner product, which I think of as the dot product of their discrete gradients. So what does that mean? So, the, so I'll write it fg sub nabla, and that will mean, this will mean the sum over all x adjacent to y of this change in f times the change in y. So this is the discrete version of what you did last time. So on a graph, you know, the gradient, if the function is defined on vertices and the gradient is something defined on edges, for every edge it tells you the change between the vertex on one end point of the edge and the vertex on the other end point. And this inner product just is sum over all edges of the product of these changes. And if I look at h of f defined to be the inner product of f with itself, in this Dirichlet inner product. That I will call the Dirichlet energy of f. And um, that is just the sum over all edges of the change in f squared. So if you know some physics, you've probably seen that if you take a mesh of harmonic oscillators, so you, you have a collection of springs um, go to get at various vertices and you try to lift the vertices to various heights, then the potential energy of the configuration will be, will have this form. It'll be a sum over this, the squares of the differences because the spring, the force is proportional to the, the distance of displacement. So um, the potential energy is proportional to the square. Okay, you know, if you don't know physics, don't worry about that. But um, that's one way of thinking of it. This is the the potential energy of a mesh of harmonic oscillators. So now, the gas free field is defined in the following way. I fix a function f0 on the boundary vertices of lambda, and the set of functions f that agree with f0 is isomorphic to Rn, where n is the number of interior vertices. And then the discrete gas free field is a random element of this space with probability density proportional to e to the minus this Dirichlet energy over 2. It's very common in statistical physics that the natural probability measure is e to the minus the energy times some constant. Um, so there's some, you know, sort of the fundamental statistical physics onsets is that over the long term, a configuration will spend time in proportional to its time in a state it's proportional to e to the minus the energy of that state. And so in some sense, you know, if I have a random bed spring and I shake it up and look at the random surface I get over the long term, you know, the, the amount of time you spend in each configuration is proportional to e to the minus the energy. Okay. So that's the discrete Gaussian free field. Um, and here's a picture of this. I took a 20 by 20 grid, fixed the boundary conditions, and chose the inside randomly from just using Mathematica's random number generators and, and did a surface plot. And you see here's a function on the 21 by 21 grid, which is zero along the boundary. And each of the 
19 times 19, uh, so 361 interior vertices, I have a number. And this is plotting the heights of these numbers. And, uh, and you see it's kind of a roughly continuously varying random surface. And, uh, and it doesn't have many really large jumps. And if you think about it, you can sort of see why. If you look at this form here, the probability of a configuration is e to the minus Dirichlet energy over 2. Dirichlet energy is 0 if a function is constant. So this is small for constant functions. If, uh, if a function oscillates a lot up and down, then this function is very large. So essentially, the most likely function is the 0 one. And so the, the system wants to be flat because I'm taking e to the minus the energy. So things with large energies are much less likely than things with small energies. I mean, if you think about it, if I had an edge where the height gap across that edge was 20, then that would contribute a 20 squared, a, a four, 400 to the energy. And when I took e to the minus 400, that would be very small. So, so large jumps are very heavily penalized. And because of that, you tend not to see many of them. So in the picture, as I change from one edge to another, the height is going up or down by, by you know, one or two or a half or a quarter. It's changing by small amounts as I go from edge to edge. And you would really have to take this picture the size of the universe before you would see a gap of size 20. They just don't happen. So it's kind of a nicely, roughly continuously varying random surface on the discrete level. And the continuum version of this is exactly what Vendelin gave for you in, in some detail last time. Uh, it's the standard Gaussian on the infinite dimensional Hilbert space. So I give you a planar domain D. I let H of D be the Hilbert space closure of the set of smooth, compactly supported functions on D under this Dirichlet inner product with a dot product of F1 and F2. The inner product of F1 and F2 is the integral over D of the dot product of their gradients. And the gas free field is the formal sum. H is the sum alpha i fi, where the fi are the orthonormal basis for H, and the alpha i are, are iid standard Gaussian random variables, mean expectation zero variance one. And, uh, and this does not converge pointwise, but it does converge in the space of distributions, which means if I give you any smooth function phi, I can make sense of the inner product of h with phi, the integral of h times phi over the domain. And, uh, you know, I can also make sense of the average value of h on a circle or on a line. So, again, it's just the limit of the sums of the averages of, the limit of the averages of these partial sums. So it's a, I'm saying it's a, very, a fairly, a uh, simple object, this Gaussian free field. And a key property is that it's conformally invariant. So if you look at this, I don't know, did you do this last time, Vendelin? Yes. So you know that this, this uh, inner product is invariant under conformal maps. So the field itself, if I define a Gaussian free field on one domain, D, and on another domain, D tilde, and I have a map from one to the other, the Gaussian free field up here, pulled back to here, is the same as the Gaussian free field over here. Okay. So, um, so now, uh, well, I'm going to talk more about what this means in a minute. These are contour lines of the Gaussian free field. But now I want to show you some pictures that, uh, that, that represent these random geometries I'm interested in. So let's see, can I dim the lights? Uh, is there, oh, here's a switch. No, oh, this turns off everything. Is this okay? I can switch this, no? It's bad, okay. Okay. Okay, can you turn off these front ones here? 
Um, that, that's it. That's it. Okay. Well, that's. This is a little spooky, but okay. This is just for a minute. All right. Um, so here, what I've done is I've taken a. Um, uh, I, I've taken a, a very fine mesh version of the Gauss, discrete Gaussian free field, and I've um, interpolated it to triangles to give myself sort of an approximation of the continuum Gaussian free field. So I have a, a Gaussian free field, and I look at the metric, which is the so lambda is a Gaussian free field, and I take e to the constant times the Gaussian free field times the Euclidean metric. So this gives me now a random metric on this plane here. And what I'm drawing for you is geodesic flows in this random metric, starting from a point at the origin. So I pick eight evenly spaced directions, and I draw straight lines in those eight directions. And because if this were a flat metric, these lines would all be straight. But because uh, of the randomness, I, I have some curvature. And as I take larger multiples of the free field, I get more fluctuation in the random surface, and I get more curvature. And if you think about it, you might ask, why are these curves intersecting themselves? And the reason is that in a, in a sufficiently irregular surface, you can have serves, curves intersecting themselves. And you can think of it the following way. Imagine your surface had a mushroom living on it, or a series of mushrooms. Then if you had a string on that surface that wrapped around some of these mushrooms, you could pull the string taut at the two endpoints, and it would still wrap around the mushrooms. And so this taut string is something that counts as a geodesic. So it's not the shortest path between two points, but it's sort of locally geodesic. When you're pulling it tight, you can't pull it any tauter. Um, so there's no locally, you can't decrease the, the length of this path. Um, so, uh, and on the surface, you, you can't always, I mean, same thing if you're on the surface of the Earth. If I start doing a geodesic flow line, eventually I'll come back and hit myself, right? So there are, so you can have surfaces where the geodesic flow lines hit themselves. And as you see, when, when this surface gets large, you kind of have these mushrooms living on the surface at all scales everywhere. And any time you, you, know, you do a geodesic flow and you hit one, you'll tend to sort of bounce around and draw funny patterns. And it starts to look almost as though these things are converging to Brownian motion in the limit, although we, I don't have a proof of that. Um, but so this is one way to try to visualize the random surfaces. But the way I'll prefer and deal with mostly in this course is trying to understand random surfaces in terms of their area measures and length measures of certain boundary sets of the random surfaces. So another way to understand the random surfaces as follows. So I'm going to define h sub epsilon of z to be the average value of, of the gas free field h on a circle of radius epsilon centered at z. Um, well, I'm going to have a few more pictures, but we can, this is fine, yeah. We don't need it to be pitch black, but, uh, well, okay. Um, so, uh, right, so if h is the free field, then for each epsilon, h sub epsilon of z is, which I find to be the average value of z on a circle of radius epsilon, this h epsilon of z is a random function. Okay, so people who are, who are scared of the Gaussian free field, and everyone has a little bit of fear when they first encounter it, um, Scared because it's a, it's a distribution. It's so intangible. It's not a function. What, what is it? Um, should be comforted by the fact that h sub epsilon of z is a function of epsilon and z. That is an honest function. It's continuous. It has the same regularity as Brownian motion. It's a Gaussian random function, meaning it's, you know, if I look at its values at a set of points, 
there's a finite set of points. That set of values is jointly a Gaussian random variable. And, um, and as a Gaussian function, it's completely determined by its means and covariances, which are very easy to explicitly write down. So this is almost as simple an object as Brownian motion, just some random function of epsilon and z. And, uh, and for each fixed epsilon, epsilon small, I consider this to be an approximation of the continuum free field. And, um, and I can take the surface, m sub epsilon, which is the surface I get by taking d and taking my metric to be e to the gamma h sub epsilon of z times dx squared plus dy squared, the Euclidean metric. And um, here gamma is some parameter corresponds to what multiple of the Gaussian free field I'm looking at. And I would like to define my Louisville quantum gravity random surface, my continuum random surface m to be the limit as epsilon goes to zero of these discrete random surfaces. But what does that mean? How do you just take a limit of random surfaces? Well, okay, there are various ways to pose this problem, but the way I'll think about limits now is I'll think about limits of the area measures. So m is a random surface which is parametrized conformally by d, and there's some area measure on m which pulls back to an area measure on d. And I would like to say that the area measures on d of these guys converge to a limiting area measure. And so then I could at least, I think of the limiting object as being some random surface, highly fractal irregular, but I have a conformal parameterization of it by d, and I have an area measure, which will then be highly singular and fractal, but in the limit, but at least it will be something we can make sense of. So here's the proposition. So I fix the gamma in 0 and 2, between 0 and 2, and I define h, d, and mu sub epsilon as above. So mu epsilon is this object here. It's the uh, epsilon to the gamma squared over 2 times e to the gamma h sub epsilon of z dz. So here I've taken this measure. This is the area measure. If I didn't have this epsilon part, this would be the area measure over here. And I'm rescaling by a power of epsilon. So sort of normalizing by power of epsilon that makes it so that these mu sub epsilons have a limit. And these converge weakly to a non trivial limiting measure, which we denote by this. So, um, by the way, can you kind of see maybe why you would need to normalize by something in order to get a limit? So, I think Vendelin showed you last time that if you, uh, if you fix z, h sub epsilon of z is a Brownian motion with respect to the log of epsilon. So as epsilon shrinks, this is fluctuating more and more. So this h epsilon of z, when epsilon is small, it's a Gaussian random variable whose variance is minus the log of epsilon. Okay? But if I take e to a Gaussian random variable with large variance, what's the expectation of that? Well, if the variance is large, then the expectation of e to th this is going to be large. Because even though this has mean 0, when I take e to it, you know, when, th when this is large, I get a very large number. When it's small, I get something that's about 0. But the average between large and 0 is still large. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, so what I find is that the smaller epsilon gets, the larger the expectation of this. And, if, and what you can check is that if I multiply by this term here, then you know, the expectation of this whole quantity is constant. So for each z, the expectation of this does not change with epsilon. And uh, <clears throat> so these mu sub epsilon are random measures with constant expectation. And in fact, 
almost surely, as epsilon scales to zero, these measures converge to a limit, which I'll call mu or mu sub h, or informally, e to the gamma h of z dz. But this doesn't exactly make sense as written because h is a distribution, not a function. So when I write this, what I mean is the limit obtained in this way. Okay, so that's, so now I've given you an honest way to take this Gaussian free field and construct a measure out of it, a measure on D. And we think of this area, this measure as being the area measure of a random surface M conformally parameterized by D. Okay, and again, we'll have some pictures of, of of metric spaces or of these random surfaces. And, um, <clears throat> and the first picture I'm going to show you is the Euclidean grid. So here I've, I've taken a bunch of squares. I think there are, uh, I think this is 64 by 64. Uh, so, th so there might be, say, 2 to the 12th, 4096 of these little squares here. And, and all of these squares have about the same area. Well, they have exactly the same area. Um, and you might say, if I gave you a, a continuum random surface, if I give you a random metric, one way to try to describe that metric would be to break it up into squares, all of which have about the same area. And here, so I took e to a small multiple of the Gaussian free field. This constructed for me a random metric, and I, <clears throat> I tried to define a bunch of squares, all of which have about the same area. And okay, how did I do this? I, um, well, I picked some small delta threshold, which was 2 to the minus 12 times the total area of my surface and said, I'm going to aim to have all the squares have size about delta. And to construct these squares, I'll start with no squares at all, then I'll divide the whole thing into four. Then each of those four pieces I'll divide into four. And each time I divide, I get a square. And, um, and when I look at that square, I, I check the area of that square. If the area of that square is bigger than delta, I subdivide again. If it's smaller than delta, I leave it alone. So when I'm all done with my subdivisions, I get a bunch of squares where the area of each one of these squares is less than delta. Because if it were more than delta, I would subdivide it again. On the other hand, the dyadic parent of each square, so this square was made by subdividing some large square, some square twice as large, which I call the dyadic parent of that square. So the dyadic parent of each square has area greater than delta, because otherwise it wouldn't have been subdivided. So in some sense, this, these squares tell you the size, is, you know, up to sort of constant area, you know the size in this random measure of each square. Because, you know, each square has area less than delta, and its parent has area more than delta. It's sort of up to constant error. I think of all these squares as having about the same size. So here, and I, I've drawn colors. I've colored squares depending on their sizes to make the picture prettier. So the bigger squares are light blue. The smaller squares are dark blue. The really small squares are purple. And, um, and you can kind of see these... Uh, Places where you have lots of really small squares, there's more surface area. There's more density to the surface here. Places here, there's, there's, the measure is less dense. When I take larger multiples of the free field, the picture gets even prettier. So you have more fluctuation. So the big squares are bigger, the small squares are smaller. And that's because I'm taking a larger multiple of the free field. So the difference between, you know, here's where the free field is large, here where it's, where it's small, and, 
you know, the density here is, you know, it's e to the Gaussian free field density. If there's a big fluctuation uh, in the free field and I multiply it by the free field by a large constant, then I'll have a very large difference in the density of the surface where the field is large and the density where it is small. <coughs> and, uh, and I can get the same thing if I take even larger multiples of the free field, I get more fluctuation. And if I take a very large multiple, <coughs> there's so much fluctuation that essentially all of the mass <coughs> is contained in a very small set of points. So if I take e to 100 times the Gaussian free field, then that one place where the Gaussian free field was large, when I take e to it, that's going to be so huge that... Um, the measure e to the gas in free field dz will have almost all of its mass near that point where the field is largest. So essentially, you know, most of the mass is in these few tiny squares here. <coughs> okay. <coughs> so now, um, uh, <coughs> I'm going to sort of not say too much about this KPZ formula because um, Bertrand is going to be lecturing on this tonight. But essentially, what it is is if I took a surface like this and took a, a random fractal on top of it, you might try to ask what's the dimension of that fractal curve. And the way you measure a dimension, if I had a Euclidean grid, if I took a fractal curve, the way I'd measure the dimension is I would ask, how many of these boxes does that curve intersect? Well, it's some number that should scale like some power of epsilon if these boxes are epsilon by epsilon boxes. And that power tells me the dimension. If I take a straight line, then the number of boxes I need to cover it is epsilon to the minus 1. If I take the whole plane, the number of boxes I need to cover it is epsilon to cover it is epsilon to the minus 2. If there's a fractal curve, maybe the number of boxes needed to cover it scales like epsilon to the minus some other power, which I can call the dimension of the fractal curve. And, uh, and the interesting thing is that you can define dimension also using these random geometries, where I draw a fractal curve and ask, how many of these boxes do I need to cover it? Okay, well, I said each of these boxes has size about delta. And I can ask, how does the number of boxes needed to cover this path scale as delta gets smaller? Well, it should scale like some power of delta. And that power is what we could call the um, sort of the, the quantum scaling dimension. And there's kind of a, a magical relationship. If you know the Euclidean quantum dimension, you know the quantum uh, if you know the Euclidean scaling dimension, you know the quantum scaling dimension. There's this nice relationship between the two. Okay. So, um, okay, so now, that's the Louisville quantum gravity. So there's a close cousin to Louisville quantum gravity which is something that, um, that I call the AC geometry, or altimeter compass geometry. Um, so quantum gravity is what you get by taking e to the h, where h is the Gaussian free field. Uh, AC geometry is what you get by taking e to the i times h. So what, okay, what is this? So, So to explain this, I'm going to start with doing something that is in some sense a, a limit of these AC geometries, which is just looking at level sets of the Gaussian free field. Um, so first of all, what are some, some properties? So I think, you know, Vendelin gave you all the continuous versions of these properties um, last time. But just for the discrete gas free field, you can see if you have zero boundary conditions, then the Dirichlet form, f inner product f, is an inner product on the space of functions with zero boundary. 
and the discrete Gaussian field is a standard Gaussian on this space. And um, you can check that if I took some other boundary conditions, <coughs> F naught, then the Gaussian field with these other boundary conditions would be the same as a free field with zero boundary conditions plus a deterministic function, which is just the discrete harmonic interpolation of F naught to this set. And, um, and there's also a Markov property which tells me that if I condition on the values of f on the boundary of a subgraph, of this graph, then the values on the remainder of the graph have this law of a GFF on this remainder with boundary condition given by the observed values. So, so in a picture like this, I would say if, you know, if I observe the values on half of this set, and that's what's the conditional law of the values on the other half. The conditional law will be a discrete harmonic function, meaning the value at any vertex is the average of the value of its neighbors. OK, now, um, it's something called the level set of the free field, which I can make as follows. Because suppose I take boundary conditions to be, so I take this as my graph. And I, I color the vertices black or white depending on whether the free field is negative or positive on that vertex. So here I've taken it to be negative on these boundary vertices, positive on these boundary vertices. I choose the inside ones randomly, and I get negative some places, positive other places. And if you think about it, if I were to linearly interpolate this function on each triangle, to give a linear, so I get a, a piecewise linear function on the triangles, then a level set of this function is going to be, well, it's negative here, it's positive here, so it's got to be 0 somewhere in the middle. It's negative here and positive here, it's got to be 0 somewhere in the middle of this edge. And since it's linear on this triangle, there's got to be a whole line segment here on which the function is 0. And a whole line segment here on which the function is 0. And line segment here and some here. And what you can see is just knowing the heights on these vertices, you can figure out that there must be a height 0 contour line or level set that passes through all of these edges and exits somewhere here. OK, and another way to visualize this is if I take the dual picture where I replace each hex vertex up here with a hexagon down here, and then I'll find that the, um, uh, that the edges this level set passes through are the duals of these edges here on this interface separating black from white. Right, so to get from here to here, I've just replaced each vertex with a hexagon. Two vertices are adjacent if their he corresponding hexagons share an edge. And um, again, I took black up here to black down here. And I could think of this path here as just being this path here. That's just a way to visualize it. So we, uh, I think we know, you, you probably learned in the SLE discussions that if you um, uh, toss an independent fair coin, for each, uh, for each one of these hexagons, then this path here in the scaling limit is an SLE, an SLE 6. And um, uh, so in this case, in our case, this, um, this scaling limit, as the mesh gets fine, of this curve is going to be some sort of an SLE 4. Because we're not tossing independent fair coins, we're choosing these colors with this Gaussian free field process. So there's some dependency structure, and it, it is something that makes a difference in the limit. Okay, so so a theorem, this is joint work with with Oded Schramm, is that if the initial boundary conditions are height lambda on one boundary arc and minus lambda on the other complementary arc. Where lambda is a special constant, root pi over 8, 
then the scaling limit of the zero height interface as the mesh size tends to zero is SLE4. Now I take boundary heights to be instead some other constants times lambda, then as the mesh got finer, the laws of the random path would be SLE4 comma A comma B, which is the variant of SLE4, SLE kappa rho. Um, which you know, I'm not going to, you don't have to worry about the definition of this for now, just know that we have an answer for what happens if you take other constant boundary conditions. So here's a picture of this. I take the discrete gas and field with minus lambda boundary conditions here, plus lambda boundary conditions here, and I drew a path, which is the interface between the places where the field is negative and the places where the field is positive. So along this path, along the left side, the heights are all negative. Along the right side of the path, the heights are all positive. And here's a, a surface plot of this. So it's some negative constant value here, some positive constant value here, randomly fluctuating on the inside. Very hard in this picture to follow what the level set is doing because you have all these peaks that sort of obscure the, the place where the level set is going through. But here I want to emphasize what happens if I fix the boundary conditions on either side of this, of this line. So, so I, what happens if I, if I just condition on the heights on either side of this line? So instead of observing the entire field at once, I just observe the numbers <coughs> that I have to observe to figure out where this line is going. So, so the, the, the heights on, on the left side of the curve and on the right side of the curve, I know. And then over here, what I graph, the color I show is, represents the conditional expectation of the height here, given the heights along this boundary line. And here's a, another s plot of this. So I, I'm given the heights along this line, conditioned on these lines, what is the expected height on the two sides? Well, in both of these pictures, one thing you notice is that, first of all, the function out here is discrete harmonic. Really what I've done is I've just taken the discrete harmonic extension of the function, which is minus lambda here, minus lambda here, and the observed values along here, plus lambda here, plus lambda here, and the observed values up here. And you notice that in this function, the heights are approximately constant on this side, and they're approximately a different constant on this side. So there's this, and we actually have a theorem that in the fine mesh limit, you really do see kind of a constant height gap between the two sides. And uh, so that suggests that you know, in the limit when I, you know, if I condition along this path, condition on this path, there's going to be an SLE on this side and an SLE on this side, or sorry, a Gaussian field. Condition on this path, I'll have a Gaussian field on this side with given boundary conditions, and a Gaussian field on this side with, with the given boundary conditions along the path. And so in the fine mesh limit, suggests there should be some way of constructing the Gaussian free field by first drawing an SLE4, and then doing an independent Gaussian free field on each of the two sides. Yes? This is for that special value of lambda. That's right. Other values will give you something different. Let me show you what happens with other values. So here I took the value minus 3 lambda on this boundary here and plus 3 lambda on the boundary here. And you see what happens here is, is it's not constant on the two sides. I still have this harmonic function, but it's very black down here, very negative, and not nearly so negative along here. And very wide up here, very positive, but not nearly so positive along here. Here's the surface plot of the same thing. 
And what you see is, what you have is approximately the function which is still, it's minus lambda on one side of the curve, plus lambda on the other side. But now I have the harmonic extension of minus lambda here, minus 3 lambda here, minus 3 lambda here, to the inside. And, and on the surface over here is roughly the harmonic extension of plus lambda here, plus 3 lambda here, and plus 3 lambda here. Yes? Yes, the jump is still the size 2 lambda. And this is something that, when you first see it, it's surprising. Now, everyone complains about this when I first show them to it, show to it and they say, you know what? I know, what, what is this lambda jump? It takes a, a little thinking to, to see why it should be there. Um, but, you know, remember what this gas should be field. It's something that has sort of constant order fluctuations between two neighboring vertices. I don't have any large height gaps. So if I look at this, when I look along this path, I know the values are negative on the left side of the path. I know the values are positive on the right side of the path. But just how negative are they on the left? Just how positive on, are they on the right? Well, probably roughly constant order. I'm not going to see anything that size 20 on the right or minus 20 on the left because that would, of course, mean I have a huge jump. So it's probably something, but I'm not going to see something zero I'm not going to see 0 0.001 on the right or 0 0.0001 on the left because those things are unlikely. There's, there's Gaussian fluctuation, you know, there's some random fluctuation. It's unlikely you'll get exactly zero. So I expect to have some, roughly some constant order on one side and roughly another constant order on the other side. And that's sort of what you would guess happens. Yes? Uh, okay, yes. So, so yes, that's right, that's right. So, so uh, what Vendelin is making is that if you, if you take the gas we filled with one boundary condition and the fill with another boundary condition, and then you restrict to some compactly supported subdomain, and ask what's the behavior of the field in that domain, the behavior of that field with one set of boundary conditions is absolutely continuous with respect to the behavior with another set of boundary conditions. We're just sort of translating by this harmonic function, but you know you, you have random translations by that same amount um, anyway. So, uh, so it tells you that when I zero in here locally, I shouldn't be able to tell what the boundary conditions are. If I just tell you what happens inside this disk, I give you the picture. Just looking at that, you can't tell whether I had plus minus lambda or plus minus 3 lambda as my boundary conditions. So if in a limit I really have, with high probability, a height gap of order lambda, 2 lambda in the, um, uh, in the plus minus lambda boundary condition picture, then I would expect to have that same order height gap in the plus minus 3 lambda boundary condition picture. OK, so the height gap is something that doesn't depend on the boundary conditions. <coughs> yes? Yes? <coughs> Why is it a constant? Well, I mean, look, doesn't it look like a constant? See? Um, so, I mean, the reason is, essentially, if I just condition on roughly the global shape of the Gaussian free field, 
then I have some sort of long-range near independence. Sort of what the field is doing here is essentially independent of what the field is doing over here. OK, and there are, there are ways to make this precise. You know, if I, if, I, if I give you a box here and I observe the box, I really don't learn any information about the box over here. It changes the expectation over here by, you know, maybe by some small amount. Um, so if I were to condition on this curve and say resample a portion of the curve near here, or resample a portion of the curve near here, um, what I see down here would be essentially independent of what happens up here. And, uh, and because of that kind of long wage independence, a, a sort of law of large numbers kicks in. So what I'm interested in knowing is if I take a point here and do a simple random walk, stopping when I hit this boundary, what's the expectation of the height at the point where I hit? Okay, that's what the discrete harmonic extension is. The value of the discrete harmonic ext extension at this point is the expected value of the height of the field at a place where a random walk started at this point first hits. First hits either the path or this boundary. So, um, so if I do a random walk starting at this point, stopping when I hit this curve, what's the expectation of that random variable? Well, again, I can hit this curve in, in lots of different places, but uh, what I want to say is because I have a lot of different choices for where to hit the curve, you know, maybe if I hit it here, it'll be very small. If I hit it here, it'll be very large. But I have all these choices, and it should kind of average out. The actual proof of this uh, is, 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 is rather difficult. So this is what, this is our big 130-page paper where most of the paper was, was proving this height gap lemma, proving that um, uh, you, in the scaling limit, you really do get minus the constant on one side plus a constant on the other side. So it's, it's not an easy theorem to prove. Um, but the, the sort of idea is just what I told you. It's just that, uh, you know, I can kind of, if I fix sort of the rough shape of, shape of the curve, but I kind of re-randomize near one point, re-randomize near another point, those things are pretty much independent of each other. And, um, uh, and so all these fluctuations kind of average out. So if I ask what's the typical height here, I mean, if I ask what's the harmonic extension here, it's sort of a weighted average of heights along all these different points. And those fluctuations at all these points average out enough that, um, that it tends to be concentrated at a particular value. I don't know. Is that enough of an answer? No? Well, what else do you want? What's that? OK. You read the paper. <laughs> it's you know, theoretically possible to do. Um, I mean, I, I agree it's not wholly convincing, but, but you know, that uh, at least tells you why it should be true, that you know, these you should have some independence intuitively between different points along the curve. OK. Um, so sort of a sketch of the proof of the SLE4 convergence is um, the following. You observe that SLE4 is characterized by the fact that it's the only random path such that if I condition on the path up to time t, um, the probability that this path passes a point z in the interior of the domain on the right equals the probability that a Brownian motion started at z first hits the path on the left. And we show that any scaling of a discrete path has to have the same property. OK, so I'm, um, I'm going to show you a few more pictures, and then maybe I'll, I'll, I'll sketch this out a little more. But essentially, what I'm saying is that a as I draw this curve, 
if I imagined um, that I'm exploring this curve dynamically, step by step, and I look at the expectation of the field as I go, the expectation is a harmonic function, which is minus lambda on this boundary, plus lambda on this boundary, minus lambda on the left side, plus lambda on the right side. So as I grow the curve, this harmonic extension is changing. And, um, and this harmonic extension uh, is, so in, in the limit, it should be, it, it, well, first of all, it should be a martingale because this harmonic extension is telling me my expected value at a point. And as I observe more and more information, expectations of random variables are martingales as I condition on more and more information. That's one way to define a martingale. You know, so I have a random variable and I observe more and more information and I update my expectation for what I think it is. And um, so, so as I observe more and more things along this path, the expectation here is changing and it should be in the scaling limit of martingale. Which means in the scaling limit, if I draw this curve here, whatever the limiting curve is, it should have the property that if I look at the harmonic extension of minus lambda on one side of the curve and here, plus lambda on the other side of the curve and here, then it should be that these, uh, this harmonic extension is a martingale for the limiting SLE. And the statement is that SLE4 is the only random curve with this property. Okay, so ergo, the scaling limit is SLE4. Okay. Now are you satisfied, Ron? With that? <laughs> no. Okay. Um, so, okay. So not wholly satisfactory, but that's a rough, a rough sketch. Okay. So, um, uh, so you might ask, how do you get um, SLE kappa from the Gaussian free field when kappa is not equal to 4? And it turns out there are two closely related ways to construct a random geometry from this multiple h of the Gaussian free field, both closely related to SLE. Okay, so as I said before, one involves the exponential e to the gamma times h. This is Louisville quantum gravity. And in this case, gamma squared is equal to the min of kappa and 16 over kappa. And in this case, SLE, SLE emerges when we conformally weld two independent Louisville quantum gravity surfaces together. And the free boundary gas free field plays the key role here. The second approach is something I call the altimeter compass geometry. And that's where you take e to the i times h divided by chi. And chi is the constant, 2 over gamma minus gamma over 2. Um, and in this case, uh, SLE emerges as, in some sense, an affine geodesic of a random affine connection. The fixed boundary Gaussian field plays the key role. Again, this here, this is, has to be in quotes, just like here, the surface has to be in quotes because we don't really have a, uh, the limiting object is not smooth. This is not a distribution. So e to the i h is not actually a function or a vector field, but somehow uh, we can make sense of it using certain couplings. So both topics can be understood via closely related coupling between SLE and the Gaussian free field. And a major goal for this week will be to construct and understand these couplings. And all through the week, you'll keep in mind these pictures that give you a sense of what's going on. OK, so what do I mean by this? So if I give you any function h, e to the i h is a, a vector field of, I could think of this as a vector field of unit vectors, right? Because um, e to the i h is, a, is something with complex modulus 1. and uh, so e to the i h is a vector which I can represent by a direction. And here I take h of x equal to y, so you can see that at each of these different heights I have a, an arrow pointing in a 
a different direction, whose direction depends on, on how high up I am. Here's a, um, and you can see there are flow lines. If I, if I ask just follow the arrows, I trace out some path. Here I take a different multiple of, I take a different function h, it's x squared plus y squared, and I get a different path. And um, so, so what I call this altimeter compass geometry is, it's a geometry you get by saying, where basically the, the lines in this geometry are the flow lines of e to the h over chi plus some constant, alpha. And alpha, in some sense, determines your initial direction. And so I can modify our direction. I'll call this direction east if alpha is 0, north if it's 0.25, west if it's 0.5, south if it's 0.75. And I can think of this, this gas free field as assigning for me a, a new compass orientation at each point in space. It turns out if h is 0, then the rays in this geometry are just those of ordinary Euclidean geometry. But in general, if H is a Lipschitz, these, these flow lines are well-defined by the standard uh, ODE, picard lindelof uh, theorem, starting at a given point. So this, this, this path exists and is uniquely determined. And um, so you might ask if there's a natural way to make sense of this object when uh, H is the Gaussian free field. And, um, and so the answer is, in some sense, there's a way to make sense of it using these couplings. So, so this, this onsatz we always have is that there's a constant height gap between the two sides. You know, going back to this picture, you know, I, I draw this level set. There's a constant gap between the two sides. You might expect that if I took a discrete approximation of the Gaussian free field and I drew one of these flow lines, that there might still be a constant height gap between the two sides in the scaling limit. That's what you'd expect to have happen. Here, if you look at a, a stable flow line, if I start a flow line here, and I look at most places where I start the flow line, it'll end up going, converting to a straight line going off to infinity in this direction. And if you look along one of these stable flow lines, what you see is that the arrows this way tend to be angling into it. The arrows this way tend to be angling into it this way. So even in a continuum picture, you can see why there should be sort of a gap where the arrows are, where the, um, the value of h should be bigger on one side and smaller on the other side. And you would expect when you draw a flow line of the Gaussian free field that you'll have h values that are smaller on one side, bigger than the other on the other side. So in the scaling limit, there should be a constant height gap. So basically, you just postulate that the scaling limit exists without proving. We don't have a proof yet that the scaling limit of these flow lines when h is a a smooth approximation of the free field. The scaling limit of these flow lines exist as the approximations converge to H. But you just sort of postulate they do, and, it, the, the, uh, and you postulate that this height gap theorem still holds. Okay, and if you make that assumption, then that tells you how to couple SLE and the Gaussian free field. You know, you should have a coupling of SLE and the Gaussian field were conditioned on the SLE. The law of the free field is the SLE with these given boundary conditions, which are just along the curve. It should just be the winding on the curve uh, minus some height on one side plus some height on the other side. Okay, so here, you know, I'll, I'll show you some pictures of what happened when I actually did this. So I took a uh, continuum gas in free field starting at one point and I drew flow lines going in a whole bunch of different directions, starting from the origin. I drew the lines in different colors. And as I take larger multiples of the free field, I see these flow lines, they get a little bit wilder. This is the New Jersey transit system, which is 
for some reason, closely related. Um, and you see that, uh, you know, it, it's kind of an interesting geometry. These curves, they look like SLE curves of some kind. And uh, at least in our way of making sense of, of this with these couplings, they are SLE curves. And um, And, and again, you know, how, how are they really characterized? Well, when I look at this flow line of a vector field, the key property is that as I follow the line, the amount that I, I turn keeps track of the height of h. When I'm turning to the left, h is going up. If I'm turning to the right, h is going down. So just by keeping track of the winding of the curve, I know the value of h. So the idea is that the extension of this curve in the Gaussian free field case, if I condition on the heights along these lines, the conditional expectation should be equal to, with each of these lines, it should be equal to the winding of the curve minus a constant on one side, the winding of the curve plus a constant on the other side. Okay, so just putting in this postulate tells you how to construct the coupling. And um, so here I, I drew some other pictures where I took all the east going and north going flow lines starting at, uh, at the, the left and bottom of the screen. And you see that the larger the field gets, the more you know, flow lines merge together. Um, and you get this kind of tree structure of flow lines. The grid gets wildly sorted. Here I threw down points at random and drew the left going flow lines on one, in, uh, and drew, drew left going flow lines from w west going flow lines from one set and east going from the other set. And you see that as you get more points, you get these sort of interwoven trees. And um, here I did a version of the flow line on the, on the grid, where you know, again you have the hexagons. When you hit a hexagon to decide whether to turn left or right, you compare the height on the, of that hexagon to the net amount of winding thus far. And again, you should, in the scaling limit, get something which is minus, it's the winding minus a constant on this side, winding plus a constant on this side. Um, and uh, OK, so that's, that's really all the pretty pictures I have for you. And that's, that's really all I have for today. So, so ultimately, you know, our goal for this week is to at least understand the problem of how it is that these random planar maps are scaling limits of discrete quantum gravity and, um, and show that at least make sense of the problem, make sense of the conjectures. And, uh, and we'll see that making sense of this involves making explicit couplings with the Gaussian free field. And, and there will be sort of two flavors of couplings, one corresponding to this altimeter compass geometry and one corresponding to this uh, um, one corresponding to the Louisville quantum gravity. Um, okay, so I'll stop here for today. <laughs>